So hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Deepak. I'm CTO at Puppet, and I've been with Puppet for a while, so maybe about nine years. Uh, and I oversee um, new product development on uh, some of our new products, like in particular Relay, as well as being responsible for the overall technological architecture and long-term technology, technology strategy of uh, everything that we do. So I'm very excited about Puppet in general, and I'm really happy to have the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, so the, to kick things off, I, I suppose the, I don't know, the American thing to do in these situations is probably start with some snarky statements about the coronavirus pandemic and how everything is horrible for us in the U.S. right now, uh, which is all true. But I'm going to try a new thing and resist the urge to go deep on that. Uh, so instead, I, I thought I would try something different. So on the one hand, it is definitely a bummer that I can't be in Singapore in person to deliver this talk to all of your, what I hope are smiling faces directly. Uh, and I don't know, certainly I suspect that many of my jokes would probably land better in person than over the internet. But on the other hand, the internet does have a way of, um, of compressing the world. So I can talk to you all from where I live in Denver, Colorado, which is about I don't know, 10,000 miles away uh, from Singapore. Although now that it occurs to me, Singapore is, you're in the civilized world, so you don't use imperial units. So, okay, 10,000 miles is, uh, okay, here we go to metric. That is 0 0.0005 light seconds. Pretty sure that's the metric measurement. I'm actually hearing that light seconds is not the metric measurement which makes a lot of sense and probably why I shouldn't tell you that it's like 295 Kelvin here in Denver right now. Okay, well, with that behind us, so the nice thing I would say uh, in this situation is that I can deliver this talk from my house. And because of this, in a very real sense, I'm bringing you all into my house for a few minutes. And that's pretty awesome. And because you're in my house, if you hear any screaming children in the background, they are right on the other side of that door and that's just how every single night is in my house during quarantine so you know we're ops people and we persevere all right let's light this candle so there are a lot of it teams out there uh that are looked at by the business i would say as a, as a cost center or even worse a bottleneck so if you want new capacity you got to go through it if you want to deploy new stuff, you got to go through IT. And the list goes on and on and on. But why is it considered a bottleneck? You know, after all, we live in an age of unprecedented infrastructure sophistication and capability. So if you think about it from one angle, operations has never had more power and choice available to us, right? There's all kinds of tools and platforms and things like that we can bring to bear to solve whatever problem we encounter. So why is there a gap between the promise of what IT can do and the actual practical reality of what we often end up doing? And I think that it ultimately comes down to having smart tools that let people disentangle the capabilities of their infrastructure from the experience of actually managing it. I, I think there's an element of risk and fear for many folks when it comes to infrastructure. In the, the, more, we, the more stuff we have, the more we tend to worry about it. Um, but I think as a thought experiment, what I encourage you all to maybe, you know, noodle on for the rest of the talk would, is, is this. What if your infrastructure was not a source of fear, but instead was a source of strength for you? What if your infrastructure was an actual catalyst or accelerant for solving major business problems, whether that's cutting costs or compliance or securing your environments? What if it helped you do that faster and better and more reliably? What if it helped you serve your customers better instead of being a constant source of worry where the more things you have, the more infrastructure you deploy, the more stress that you feel. So that's the kind of Aikido move that, I'm in, that I think that we need to pull on all of our infrastructure. We need to take it from being a bottleneck to something that's a genuine catalyst. So why Puppet? you know, as the one to help you do that. Um, so I think my contention is we're ideally suited to kind of help you handle these kinds of problems, but, but why? And I think there's a couple of interesting reasons why. I think first, 
you know, we are a leader in DevOps. We're one of the original DevOps companies, and we were one of we were there at the foundation of that movement. And you know, we also produce things like the State of DevOps Report, which is one of the longest running and largest body of DevOps knowledge on planet Earth. There are thousands, tens of thousands of people that contribute to that thing every year, and millions of people benefit from all the research that we do. So I think that's a really powerful thing. Um, beyond that, I think we have an extremely large and really vibrant community. 75% of the commits, if you add up like all of the repositories that comprise all of our products, 75% of those come from the community. We have thousands of modules available on the Forge. There are tens of thousands of users that use Puppet to manage millions of systems out there. Uh, and there are hundreds of thousands of people that visit the Forge to check out new content or download stuff and otherwise get a running start trying to automate things. All culminating in what we track is millions and millions of downloads of all of our stuff. So. You know, we're not an unknown quantity. We've been doing this stuff for a while and we do it really well for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And then lastly, uh, we are the market leader. And I think the reason why we're in such a good position here is that philosophically Puppet wants to meet you where you are and take you where you need to go. And in order to achieve that mission, we basically run everywhere on zillions of systems, on dozens of different operating systems and architectures, and we let you talk to systems in a huge variety of ways, whether that's desired state or tasks, plans or event-driven workflows. I like to think that we have the ability to cover a huge number of different automation scenarios. And I think in this unpredictable world, chances are we've got you covered. And that's something that I am super proud of. So I've kind of teed up uh, the ambition, right? Which is, you know, I want to help you automate everything, ideally everywhere, uh, as easily as possible, because I want you to go from your infrastructure being a source of stress and being a bottleneck to something that is genuinely a source of strength and more of a catalyst for change. So what's actually standing in the way? Right? And I think there's a bunch of different ways to analyze that particular problem, but I like to put the challenges into three major buckets, uh, scale, heterogeneity, and pressure. Um, so if you take just those three things, I think DevOps practices in general are a really great way to kind of balance these three competing concerns against each other. Uh, and we've done the research on that, so you can check our math. Um, but while DevOps, as a concept is a great start, I think there are still a lot of challenges in the way that get in the way of people actually seeing a ton of success. So in fact, uh, the, a lot of these stats uh, that are gonna be on this slide come from Gartner. So by 2023, they estimate that as many as 90% of enterprises will fail to actually scale their DevOps initiatives if they don't create a share a, a self-service platform. So I think this is really trying to indicate that even with the best of DevOps -y intentions, if there's still a lot of human limitations or maybe human bottlenecks or a single team that is capable of doing that stuff in an agile way, um, it doesn't sufficiently scale to the rest of the company in a way that truly allows them to handle the larger and larger problems that they have. So that's why, even though the you know, Global 5000 is already operating at a huge scale, a lot of the biggest names on that list are still in a bit of a pickle with respect to the future because they don't have the requisite amount of automation that's pervasive enough and that's self-service enough in order to help them actually solve these problems really quickly and easily. So further complicating that, is the fact that infrastructure continues to just get more complicated as time goes on. So Gartner estimates that 75% of large and medium-sized enterprises will have either hybrid IT or multi-cloud by 2021. Um, and I talk about this particular point a lot. I think I mentioned it in my keynote at Puppetize last year, and usually in many talks I'm called upon to give, I make the same point. Um, because I think it's something that not a lot of people think about. Um, I think that uh, in a sufficiently large enough business, 
you are always going to have a pocket of people that are using something bleeding edge because that's what you want them to be able to use. But that bleeding edge, if you tick forward on the timeline, maybe a year or two years, um, the next bleeding edge thing might look very different. And if you do the math and extend that timeline all the way out, I think it's inevitable that companies will end up with this increasingly heterogeneous mix of different kinds of applications deployed according to different architectural patterns, running in different kinds of infrastructure environments, managed in very different ways. Um, and that kind of world, the struggle is very real. Um, and I think all of this uh, happens in front of this uniform backdrop, which is pressure. And I think that it's um, really easy to, for companies to kind of fall into this mode where they think that there's so much immediate urgency in terms of like ac critical tactical IT problems that there's not enough time to think about what to do beyond the tactical. What are the strategic things you need to do? What are the strategic things that you need to do IT wide or company wide in order to really be able to solve the challenges of tomorrow? And I think this dissonance between a tactical focus but a strate and a strategic need results in stuff that our own research indicates uh, as manifested in this gap between what executives think uh, their progress is on automating things, DevOps initiatives, just modernization initiatives in general, and just how well they're doing at automating stuff and how quickly their business can adapt when compared to what the actual experience is for boots on the ground. Actual administrators, people with hands on keyboards report very different experiences. And I think that's because of that dissonance that lies between the focus on the tactical, because there's always something that you have to do right now because of the pressure and the need to be more strategic so that that pressure can be relieved over time. So I think clearly there needs to be a way that allows companies to kind of navigate these three competing concerns, right? So. Let's talk about how. So the value ultimately, I think, of any company really lies in, you know, what it is capable of actually doing. You know, no company, very rarely, is a company in business to run infrastructure. Most companies, typically, the infrastructure in IT is really a means to the end, where the end is delivering features to customers or customer satisfaction or otherwise being a business, right? Um, and I think because of that focus, application delivery is really a super high priority. Um, and in order to deliver applications as quickly and robustly as possible, you know, this is, this is tough. Like that's a company-wide thing. And if you wanna have a company-wide focus on a company-wide thing like that, you're gonna end up uh, inevitably touching on different individual teams as part of that solution. Um, and that's everything from security teams, infrastructure management teams, compliance folks, uh, teams of architects, uh, centers of excellence in terms of DevOps. Um, and all of this is done, especially these days, with this omnipresent um, remote workforce with, that can, in many, in many company cultures, makes collaboration more challenging than it used to be. So I think all of these things together create uh, an even elevated sense of urgency around trying to solve these problems, but also it creates a set of roadblocks, I think, that are in the way. All right. So... The next thing I think I would say on this one is that because of the sprawl and the heterogeneity that, that exists, I think, in everyone's infrastructure, companies today have a just a vast litany of different applications, services, different APIs, all kinds of technologies running on-prem or in the cloud or both and beyond in order to actually, in order to just work, right? Um, so because of that, I think, um, there's this meme present where if I just adopt a sufficiently modern technology, you know, platform, if I move everything to the cloud and do things in this bleeding edge way, everything will become easier. But the reality is we've started to see it play out is actually pretty different. And in fact, it's uh, not the case that IT is shrinking at all. Headcount is actually rising. 
on-prem solutions still remain present where they always have been in addition to an expanded cloud portfolio. Things are getting bigger, things are getting more complicated, and there's more people now that companies are trying to mobilize to solve a lot of these problems. And you know that just adds to, again, a lot of the overall complexity of what's happening here. So I think that in an environment like this, um, I think it's safe to say that pretty much any goal that you're trying to hit as a company is a lot harder. Um, and especially when some of those goals or needs are really time sensitive, like if a breach was detected or if there's an active vulnerability in some of the software that you use, those are time sensitive things. But touching all these different teams and all these different parts of the overall kind of supply chain just make a lot of these problems potentially more complicated than ideally they should be. So I think it's a good trend that more and more companies are trying to use DevOps to uh, help overcome this kind of problem. And I think that's, uh, it's a really good and encouraging uh, set of proof points that we're starting to see in the industry where companies are now starting to incorporate things like security earlier into the development process so that it remains present throughout the entire life cycle of that piece of software. Um, but I think those processes by themselves are not enough. I think there's more that we need to do. And I think that's because at the end of the day, I, I firmly believe that we're not as an industry just going to sweat our way through all of these problems. It's not a matter of simply just working harder or working more, right? I think what we need are infrastructure platforms that have the right capabilities. So by capabilities, I mean a couple of things. Infrastructure as code lets you manipulate your infrastructure like you can change software. Uh, and I think that's a truly powerful concept because I do believe also that in the aggregate for a complicated enough estate, for a complicated enough infrastructure, managing it starts to look more like managing a software program. So being able to change your infrastructure with the same amount of ease as you would refactor a piece of software, I think is very powerful and a step change in how agile a company can be. So secondly is automation everywhere. So automation that covers your whole estate allows you to quickly address a bunch of new problems at scale reliably because after all, that's the exact sort of thing that automation is good at. That's kind of the point. And while automation scales out to what you need to do, self-service will scale out who can actually do it. Uh, and that allows you to enable others to help themselves ideally eliminating a lot of those bottlenecks while still preserving the amount of control and governance that you need to keep things running smoothly and efficiently. So let's talk through a couple of specific examples of companies that have had to deal with these kinds of problems and then what we at Puppet help them do in order to solve them. So Transurban is a top 15 Australian publicly traded company that operates a bunch of different toll roads uh, in Australia, and they have eight new roads that they need to open in the next five years. So they have thousands of employees in Australia, in the US and Canada, and they informed us that they have over 100,000 different pieces of technology involved in road management, which blows my mind. Uh, I spend a lot of my time dealing with like pure software companies and how complicated their worlds are. So it's kind of interesting to hear about a company that deals with something like as far away from software as one would normally think like roads, and think about just the sheer vast amount of technology required to actually make that work, right? So Transurban really went all in on digital transformation. And a big part of that was their move to DevOps. And they wanted to really speed up their ability to automate things at scale while maintaining their reliability posture. After all, you know, it's roads, right? That's not a thing where failure is really tolerated. So what Transurban did is they adopted Puppet Enterprise uh, in concert with VMware vRealize and ServiceNow, along with a bunch of other tools to help uh, enable them to give their employees self-service infrastructure provisioning and administration. So their teams interact with their infrastructure increasingly through things like chat ops and Slack uh, to give them um, real-time reporting on what Puppet is doing um, or other reports that leverage Puppet data. And they have self-service portals that they've built in concert with Puppet APIs leveraging uh, ServiceNow. So these are all tools that they had employed internally already. 
And then by leveraging a lot of the data inside of Puppet, it allows them to deliver more value to their entire uh, employee base more quickly. And it allows them to automate more stuff more reliably at the scale that they need. So I think this is a great example of what's possible when you have that automation dial tone uh, across everything. It allows you to bring a vast or a variety of information uh, to your fingertips and then you can use that to empower a larger number of people inside of a company. So I think that's pretty great. So New York Stock Exchange is part of Interco Intercontinental Exchange, which owns actually 23 different exchanges and marketplaces. I'm going to try to minimize the number of times I use the word exchange in this paragraph, but uh, it's a truly massive scale. The total market cap for what they do hit uh, about $25 trillion uh, several years ago, uh, and they're twice the size of their nearest competitor. Um, so it's a truly global thing, and you can imagine how important something like reliability and security are in this kind of environment, right? So because of that, you can, uh, you can just imagine what sort of pressure to innovate uh, New York Stock Exchange is. And it's the same pressure that everybody else has. You know, they constantly need to be delivering new services and new features, but they have that added pressure of like, this stuff can't ever go down. There's so much money at stake and it's a constantly live environment. So how do they kind of scale up their infrastructure and all their workloads efficiently, um, but do that in a way that is reliable and robust? So in concert with a bunch of Puppet technology, they have vastly improved server provisioning, um, and that happens, according to them, about 144 times faster than it was before, which I think is phenomenal. And part and parcel with that is how security updates are now way faster and much more consistent, which keeps them happy, it keeps their customers happy, and it keeps auditors happy because Puppet Enterprise is what's enforcing all their consistency. So I think this example is great because it emphasizes how in these high pressure environments, the answer to a lot of these IT problems isn't to move more slowly. That's not how you mitigate risk. And in fact, it's the opposite. You wanna move more quickly using automation to lower your risk while letting you get things done more quickly than you could before. Guardian Life IT Services uh, supports a bunch of different applications and it's actually a 159 year old company. So if you want to talk about sprawl and technical debt, I mean, they could probably, you don't want to have a contest with them, I imagine. So their team embarked on a really fast and accelerated migration to the cloud, but the complication was that they inhabit a really highly regulated environment with a ton of security and compliance constraints. So their cloud estate covers thousands of AWS servers, you know, running production and non-prod workloads across Windows and Linux. Uh, and this is complemented with a number of infrastructure and security compliance tools they have running in Lambda and a number of applications running on Docker. So they use Puppet Enterprise to provide a standardized lockdown EC2 environment uh, with all the secure OS controls that they need, as well as customizable modules for all the different middleware that they have to have. And it gives them, you know, all the compliance reporting that they need, which is a huge deal for them. And because it's Puppet, we eliminate configuration and system drift. And this is all across all the different operating systems in play, whether that's Linux or Windows to host running Docker for all their containerized apps. So I think that's a really good example of how even in the cloud, that sprawl is still very real. And there are still a lot of these classic problems that you have to deal with and how you are able, how well you're able to migrate your workloads to the cloud is largely limited by how you can still provide the same level of infrastructure automation and security and robustness, no matter where your applications are actually running. So at this point, you know, hopefully I've set up the problem statement and talked through some examples of customers experiencing these problems and how we help. And these are exactly the kinds of scenarios I'm interested in solving for all of you with every product that we make. Uh, and we make a lot of stuff to cover all the different automation scenarios that you are likely to encounter. Um, so, you know, I believe that in having complementary tools that are greater than the sum of their parts. So rather than give you a checklist of features, you know, I'd rather give you an automation platform. And that's what I believe we've done. So 
the platform that we have is built on a solid open source base. And that's a huge part of our overall just DNA as a company and something that I'm personally very proud of. My first exposure and interactions with Puppet was as a community member. And now that I'm working here, you know, that's something that I am very mindful to never forget. Um, so, you know, that's just part of everything we do. Um, on top of that, the Puppet Enterprise platform, which incorporates that open source tech, is really the foundation for all our higher level automation capabilities. So that's tools like Bolt, which lets users easily execute ad hoc tasks and plans across their whole estate uh, agentlessly. There's products like Remediate and Compliance, which provide more turnkey and purpose-built experiences for remediating vulnerabilities and ensuring your infrastructure meets your compliance standards. So those products leverage the power of Puppet to take action on systems at scale, but they surface that power in a really nice and user-friendly way, optimized for the kinds of problems they're intending to solve. There's companion products like CD for PE, which takes Puppet Enterprise's foundational capabilities and add things like predictive impact analysis and automated testing. Um, and that's a great example of taking full advantage of Puppet's features. So we can tell you what will happen when you deploy a change, but before you deploy it. Isn't that wild? Like, I think that's a great feature. Um, and then there's newer stuff like Relay that I think uh, Melissa Sussman's gonna be talking about later on in the Puppet Camp. And that allows you to express event-driven automation workflows. So you can listen to events from a huge number of different cloud providers or third-party APIs or Puppet itself. And you could have that trigger all manner of customizable and remixable workflows to let you automate more things more quickly. And that's critical if you're running, especially in the cloud and leveraging a bunch of powerful APIs to get things done. And lastly, tying all this stuff together is all of the great content and integrations produced by our huge community of users. So, you know, thanks to all of you because we wouldn't be where we are without all of your help. So the last thing I want to talk about is just what our overall vision is. So ultimately, my mission, and hopefully this has come through in the talk so far, is that I really just want to make your infrastructure more observable, actionable, and intelligent. And I want to do that for all of your stuff, no matter where it runs and no matter what it's running. And I want to give you all multiple ways of talking to and addressing those systems to ideally match the task at hand. Yeah, it sounds easy, right? Well, um, you know, it's only software. And there's a lot of things I can't change in the world right now that I wish I could. And thankfully, software is one of the things I actually can change. So, you know, I want to thank you all for uh, being along with us on this journey. And we're here to help and would love to talk to you more. And with that, you know, I just want to say thank you for listening. So we've got a great set of talks coming up that I can't wait to see. So cheers, everyone. And I look forward to a time when I am once again legally allowed to see you all in person. So cheers. <laughs>